Hello everyone, on today's video we're going to be taking a look at the uh, very sexy topic of air spaces. So depending on what country you are, you're going to get a different experience as far as what kind of air spaces you're going to encounter, as well as what they mean and all those kind of stuff. But for us, we're going to take a look at American air spaces because they're the ones I'm most familiar with. There are very, very similar air spaces in other countries, so you just kind of, kind of have to work with what you got. So this presentation, of course, is going to be two parts here. Well, not only do we have our handy dandy actual diagrams and explanations, but we're also going to take a look at over in the flight simulator as well. So you can kind of see the two side by side. So first things first, um, air spaces are divided into two major categories. You have what they call a controlled airspace, where some kind of controlling agency, usually through radio, is going to be dictating the traffic in it. And you have what they call uncontrolled airspace, which is going to be airspace that basically it's a free-for-all. The good news is there's only one type of uncontrolled airspace, and that is called Class Golf, or Class G airspace. To be in Class G airspace, you basically just show up. So the good news for us is um, that's the only one you're probably never going to see, uh, especially if you're like you're in the middle of the uh, American West or you're up like in Alaska or something like that. You might see some of it, but the reality is the vast majority of airspace you're going to encounter as a pilot, at least in the U.S., is going to be Class E, which is Class Echo airspace. So let's go ahead and take a look at each airspace in reverse. So the first one, like I said, is your Class G airspace. Um, basically, it's a great airspace. A lot of times it exists underneath other airspaces just because it's so darn low. Uh, the interesting thing with Class G is it has the widest range of acceptable visibilities. In the daytime, um, you get one mile of visibility, which is considered the minimum. Anything less, you're not supposed to be flying VFR. Uh, at night, the visibility requirements stay the same, but they go up to three miles. And I say plenty of cloud clearance. That just means you've got to be 500 feet below it. The interesting thing here, too, is that you have to be very careful because Class Class G airspace in the U.S. can become a TFR, which is a temporary flight restriction. Now, if I take a look at my chart real quick, if you see these little regions where you kind of have this red shaded zone here, those are all controlled airspaces. You can see they have all the big circles here and stuff like that. All this junk between it is not controlled airspace. This is all going to be your class golf airspace. Obviously, there's an MOA. That's a military operation area over on that side. So again, this is going to be all your class G. It's basically a free for all. Okay, our next type down from that is what I like to call Class E, or I don't like to call it, the feds do. Class E is echo airspace. This is airspace that contains some kind of instrument procedures. So if I go ahead and pop back over to my chart real quick, all this red fuzzy stuff is Class Echo airspace. So when you get around kind of the region in the world where I live, there is a tremendous amount of Class E airspace on account of the fact that there's so much traffic in this particular area. Generally, you're going to have Class E airspace or Echo airspace whenever you have some kind of VFR flight route, anything along those lines, and you're going to see a tremendous amount of that Class Echo airspace. Uh, the key thing there is that for Echo airspace, you can operate in it. There's no danger for you being in there. The only thing you have to watch out for, though, is if you're flying along it, keep in mind there is IFR traffic in it. IFR traffic can be super tricky for us because they are like lasers thanks to GPS on it. So you want to be very, very cautious flying around. Now let's take a look in the airport airspaces. Our next type of airspace is going to be called Class Delta airspace. Class Delta airspace is going to be basically airspaces that are going to be dedicated to very, very small places where there's control towers. Technically, every airport with a control tower owns its own Class Delta airspace. It's a very, very, very small. Now, the big thing is whenever you have Delta airspace, you need to have two-way communications with whomever you're actually going to be dealing with in order to go ahead and safely operate in that zone. You're not supposed to fly through it without permission. Visibility requirements are basically three miles and a thousand feet on everything. And um, this is kind of an interesting fact. Not all class Delta airspace is open at all times. It's actually kind of interesting because uh, when a tower actually signs off, it becomes class echo airspace. Now, if we take a look at the chart, class D airspace can be a little difficult to see because a lot of times, ah, here we go, right here. Oops, I shouldn't have zoomed in. You can see this little dashed line right here. This is going to be class delta airspace here. What you'll see sometimes is there'll be a little cutout like this, which will basically dictate exactly where that kind of zone kind of starts and ends. You kind of got to be cautious with that. Our next type of airspace down is called Class C or Class Charlie. This is the I'm a major airport and I own this area kind of airspace. If you take a look at my chart here, you can see this little Mode C, Class C airspace right along this arc right here. Don't get those confused with the echo regions. That's going to be this crazy arc that you see right here. Again, major, major, major airports will have this all the way out to 30 nautical miles, which is a tremendously long distance for these particular airspaces. Other requirements for Class Charlie airspace is 
devices are pretty much the same as everything else. Uh, keep in mind, not all of them 24 hours a day. Watch out. You need two-way communication with the ATC in that space. Um, you're probably sitting there going, well, that's easy. You just call them up and they call your name back. And you're like, yeah, you've now gotten yourself two-way communication, so you don't have to worry about it. Interesting thing, too, is if you're in an airport that is has crossed Charlie airspace above you, it seems to be having some network issues today, such as the Upperville Airport over here, you have to actually get permission from the major airport before you're allowed to take off out of it in order to safely go ahead and operate inside of this region. So on the next thing you want to watch out for with Class Charlie airspace is um, just because you have two-way communication doesn't mean you can ignore instructions from air traffic control. As a matter of fact, one of the common problems you have is you'll be, let's say, you come in here and you're trying to go over here and you basically have to pass through their Charlie airspace. The only way you can do that, of course, in the real world is you could call them up and say, hey, I'd like transition Charlie, which just means can I fly through? Or the safer way to do it is to get flight following, which precludes the need to actually do any of that. So it's actually very effective. Another thing we want to take a look at is what they call Class Bravo airspace. Now, this is a solid blue arc. Uh, again, this is even more complicated because whereas Class Charlie, all you need to do is have two-way communication. Again, you must comply with all air traffic control. A Class B or Bravo airspace is going to not allow you in it without air traffic control clearance, which means you have to be cleared through it, which is a little different. So you can see we've got ourselves a little mode C here. This is our Class Charlie. There's our Class Bravo airspace. You have to actually get permission to enter it. You can't just call them on the radio and be nice about it. Um, interesting thing is student pilots aren't allowed to operate in Class B airspace. I always thought that was funny. Uh, in the United States, uh, this is an interesting problem because uh, if you're like learning to fly and you want to fly into like Dulles or or something crazy like this, uh, you'd have to actually get permission to do so. I mean, basically from a flight instructor, they'd have to, quote, take responsibility if you want to think about it another way. We'll talk about limits in a second. Our final kind of airspace you're going to see is what they call Class Alpha airspace. Class Alpha airspace is the weird one because it exists from 18,000 feet to 60,000 feet. If you take a look at my chart right here, it actually makes a little bit more sense. My Alpha airspace is basically parked on top of everything. You have to be under instrument flight rules to operate in Alpha airspace. So if you've got a bunch of really, really tall mountains here and you go whoopsie daisy like that, you're busted. By the way, if you're wondering why these uh, weird little shapes kind of look like these weird little upside down wedding cakes, it's because all airspaces are designed to provide a protected area for instrument aircraft to be operating from. So if I'm coming into a landing from 18,000 feet, when I cross into this class Charlie airspace, basically I'm trying to have a protected zone that I can fly all the way down to the ground uh, nice and safely and nice and easily without too, too many other considerations otherwise. So another thing you want to watch out for too is different parts of the airspace may have a different height restriction. You could actually fly over an airspace or you could fly under an airspace. It's actually very, very neat how that plays out from time to time. I'll again, excuse my net connection seems to be a bit slow today. So if you take a look real quickly here, you can see that I've got this weird little blue text that says 100 over 25. What that simply means is everything inside of this region here is existing between 2,500 feet in 10,000 feet, which means if I'm at 10,000 feet in one, 10,001 feet, I'm actually above the airspace and not violating it, even though I'm physically laterally over the airspace. Likewise, if I get myself down to 1,800 feet, for example, I actually can safely fly under the airspace without violating anything or requiring any sort of special permissions. Now, you got a nice little contradiction here where you can see this outer ring starts at 4,500 feet to 10,000. The inner ring is 10,000 feet to 25,000. The inner, inner, inner ring is 10,000 to 1,500 feet. Now you can see that the little rings are actually labeled nice and conveniently for you, so it makes it very, very easy to identify exactly where you're trying to travel. Now here's a fun problem. If I wanna travel through this zone here, if I go at 2,900 feet, I'm safe, but my minimum safe altitude is 2,300 feet. So it creates an interesting little problem as I'm trying to kind of zip through here without accidentally crossing onto this airspace. Okay, so that's going to be all of our basic airspaces. Again, uh, we're just kind of you can take a look at this little diagram. There's an example of this online as well. Uh, there's a couple other funky airspaces out there, and uh, these are called the special use airspaces. If you want to take a picture of my slide here, feel free to do so. And again, basically, these are going to be the zones where you cannot operate a plane legally. Um, for either there's the military's practicing something. You've got uh, areas like I chose this one down in Washington D.C. because you know it's this you know country's capital, so um, we don't like to mess around in this zone. So it's very, very restrictive for what you can go in there. You also have something called the ADIS, which is basically where they're going to be identifying you for all sorts of traffic and stuff like that. 
Of course, you have your MOAs, you have MTRs. Again, this is all different depending on where you are in the world, as well as stuff like that. Again, I can say some pretty sarcastic comments here, but I think you have the general idea. Okay, let's go pop over to the simulator now and uh, figure out exactly what this means for us. So what I've done is I've set myself up a pretty simple scenario here. I'm uh, directly to the west. Actually, I'll zoom out. I'll use my handy-dandy built-in avionics to show this off, right? Okay, delightful. So what I want to do is I want to travel over here to Ellington Airport. Right in the middle, it's uh, going to be difficult to see. Unfortunately for us, we don't have the airspace display that I can just kind of show off. Normally, you press a button like that, and you have a little option for it so you can turn it on, but we don't have that here. There is a very, very large major airport here, Bradley International. You can actually see it. Bradley International Airport is protected by a Charlie and Delta airspace. So what we actually need to do is we need to fly to it, and we've got to, if we can't fly over it, which, by the way, it's a relatively tall airspace, we have to request permission to go through it. So there's two ways we can do that in the flight simulator. The first method we can do is we can call up approach and we can actually ask them for flight following. If we request flight following, as long as we follow their instructions, they will tell us when we go through this airspace. We've essentially established two-way communication. So let's go ahead and kick that in first. Button and pause so we can continue our little flight here. Now notice when they do this, uh, they're going to give you a squawk number. The squawk number is absolutely critical because it's going to let them know where you are. So you simply acknowledge it. You just go to here. Four, three, three. And that's all you have to do. As soon as they identify it, by the way, in the real world, as soon as you do that, you bop the ident button to let them know exactly where you are. So because of this, we can now violate that airspace all we want, as long as we are complying with the instructions provided to us by air traffic control. So actually, you can see a ski slope right here. It's kind of cool. So uh, now that we've done that, we don't have to worry about those pesky airspaces. Again, you wouldn't want to fly through an MOA or anything like that. Again, that's the military operations era. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to cancel flight following, because I want to show you the other method you can get clear that Charlie Air airspace. Again, the Charlie airspace here is uh, quite tall. So now I go back to my regular frequency. I'm just going to go back to 1200, which in the U.S. is going to be what they call VFR. 1200, everything's good. I press the, whoa, I keep pressing the backspace button. Boop, you don't have to identify or anything like that. Good. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to call Bradley. Uh, Bradley, I always forget the frequency from Bradley. Do, 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 Bradley. Of course, you want to get this before you cross into their airspace, which is that little mountain range directly ahead of us. And normally what you do is you call up the tower, and you request inside of the tower to transition through their Charlie airspace. Now, unfortunately for us, because of the way this is set up, if I fast forward a little bit here. Because of the way this is set up, we can't request that early, which is actually kind of unfortunate, because if we could, we could get that going right away. So the other method you could use, of course, is you could call back the approach controller. You know, again, the nearest approach would be Bradley approach, and you could ask them for that transition Charlie. Now, for those of you who remember the earlier version of Flight Simulator, you probably went through this whole experience where you can go in here and request that. So what we'll do real quick is we'll go ahead and uh, lose a little bit of altitude and basically pow right through the center of it and uh, see if they get grumpy at us. All right, and you can see by my little chart here that I went powering right into their protected airspace. You can see that a little bit more clearly now that we've zoomed in on the screen. Again, this is going to be their class Charlie, and we're right about to zip through it. Notice still, though, they have not given us the option to transition Charlie, which means there are only two ways we're going to be able to get away with this now is going to be getting that flight following like we saw earlier, again, going over there, or, and the simple way to do it, is to actually declare your flight to be an instrument flight. So in this case, I can call up approach, and, uh, ah, there it is. Is. I'm sorry, I was being off a little bit. Now we can request class C transmission. So basically right now is even though I've flown through the airspace, I can now request a class Charlie airspace transition, even though um, I am well within it. Remember, you have to get permission before they're actually going to allow you to do that. Notice they're going to request you to do a squawk number to keep track of you during this actual flight through their Charlie airspace. Now the interesting thing is I can actually get out of their Charlie airspace, and I can do that by basically flying under underneath it. Now I'm not going to do that right now, but I do want to show you something else pretty cool. 
All right, go ahead, da, 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 maintain home navigation. Cool, they're not giving me any specific instructions. What I do wanna show you though, is if you take a look at my little map display, do you see how their Charlie airspace here has got a little hole cut out of it for Bravo Niner? This is actually going to be a special little area that's just for this airport so people could take off and shoot west as fast as they can. Okay, let's take a look at the third option we have for going ahead and uh, getting ourselves out of the situation. We can also request IFR clearance. Now, IFR clearance is interesting because uh, IFR basically means air traffic control already knows about us and is going to dictate exactly where we want to be at any given time. So in this case, they're going to give me all the detail, clear to several Bravo 9 airport as filed, squawk 1373. Now that this has been issued, we're already in two-way communication with air traffic control, which now means that we don't have to worry about that particular detail. We just keep following their instructions until we get all the way down to the ground. So radar contact, da-da-da, turn left, heading 095, uh, resume own navigation. That's okay. That 905, by the way, you can see the major airport pretty clearly now, and you can see we're violating its airspace uh, pretty royally here. But since we have, we got that, first of all, we got that Charlie Clan transition, which we should have been able to ask for a lot sooner. And we were also able to declare an instrument flight plan and since we're in the system now they trust us and know exactly where we need to go at any given time check this out they're going to go ahead and say expect a visual and look at this they're going to basically drop me all the way down onto the ground at that airport okay hopefully this uh, video is helpful again uh, my little boo-boo there is uh, you have to request charlie transition from the approach controller you don't do it through the tower that was my boo-boo so the three methods is uh, first of all you can get flight following you can do an instrument flight plan, or you can resist, uh, request transition through that specific type of airspace. So I'm just going to acknowledge my approach and everything like that. And I'll go ahead and take a look at the airport. Now, normally when you're flying over a zone like this, what they'll actually ask you to do is fly over the center of the runway, because um, airplanes don't land vertically, so you're perfectly safe when you do something along those lines. All right. Hopefully this uh, video has been uh, kind of helpful. I'll go ahead and post a link to the slides in case anybody needs. Again, I do a little thing at my local school where I kind of help folks out, kind of understand the basics. But again, it, it might not be too helpful for stuff you need to enjoy.